Yeah, trying to put the pressure on, yeah. That was always coming. And after this, three more on the road for Toronto before they're finally at home. You see Toronto put the pressure on here. See if the addition of Wengluski makes much of a difference. It may. It didn't on that last scrum, though. Look how low they're getting. <laughs> Toronto, just an absolute destruction job. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the LaRouge Rugby Podcast. My name is Dan Murphy, and with me always is Derek Brissett and Stu Hardy. Now, we have an exciting, exciting guest with us today, uh, a member of the Toronto Arrows and a member of uh, Rugby Canada's national team. We have Cole Keith with us. Cole, thanks again for uh, joining us on the podcast. We're really excited to have you here and chat about uh, your, little, your little world that, uh, that you've kind of caved for yourself. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Looking, I've been looking forward to doing this all week. So uh, we're going to get right into it, Cole. Um, whenever we have a guest on, we always want to kind of talk about you know, the, their background in rugby. And so uh, the first thing is, what have you been up to in the last few months? You know, the, f- to be a professional, you know, athlete and then just hear, okay, your season's over. I mean, I think MLR is one of the only, you know, pro sports teams in North America, at least, that kind of said, we're done. So what have, what have you been doing to kind of keep yourself fit and, and busy? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's been, it's definitely been tough the last few months saying uh, motivated and everything but no I've just been back uh, I've just been like as soon as all the gyms and everything opened back up it was pretty much right back to it um, twice a day for you know five days a week and then once a day for the other two usually so uh, it's been it's been training pretty hard actually the last few months trying to get back because it was it was tough taking three uh, three months off basically from everything just because there was nothing open and stuff tried to do a bit of running here and there but I'm not a, not a big fan of doing the fitness. So, uh, yeah, just been trying to get back in the gym and get, uh, get the, you know, your body right for these uh, upcoming games that we're planning on having. So. All right. So, well, it's uh, good to hear that you're uh, kind of getting back in the gym and getting uh, ready to go for uh, whenever rugby is able to return. But you know, why don't we uh, rewind it a little bit to the beginning? How did, uh, how did Cole Keith get started in the game of rugby? How did you come to find the sport and uh, how'd you come to love it afterwards? Uh, yeah. So actually, um, so as you guys probably know, it's not probably one of the most popular sports on the East coast, depending on where you're, uh, where you're located. But um, no, there was a, a teacher when I was in middle school, grade six, um, and we had a team at our middle school. And I was just always, I played like, played all sports growing up and was like a physical player in hockey and everything like that. And uh, anyway, so then there was rugby. And I remember like, just like seeing some of it every now and then, like just kind of wondering. So I went and played it that year on uh, grade six. And then there was no team for two years. And then I just started playing again in uh, high school when there was another opportunity to have it. And then just kind of went from there. So. Okay. So but there's a bit of a gap between playing in high school and playing for the Toronto Arrows and Rugby Canada. When yeah. Did you realize you could play at a higher level? Um, I don't know if there was a, a specific moment when I kind of thought maybe I could do this um, for a career, but um, I don't know, like I played like for the New Brunswick team and the Atlantic team and stuff kind of through the age grade system, started with the uh, under 16s, went to under 18s for New Brunswick, then went to the U19 Atlantic team for the CRC competition and then um, yeah, then just moved out to, uh, to BC basically, and then got selected for the, uh, uh, the carding program back when it was kind of in its initial stages and, uh, and yeah, just kind of being in that program, maybe for four or five months, just training and kind of, you know, seeing what really it takes instead of, you know, just rocking up on a Tuesday, Thursday night and having a couple beers after and then playing a game on Saturday. You know, it's a little bit more into it than that now. So uh, 
I don't know if there was yeah, ever really a specific time where I kind of thought like, you know, I can do this. It's just always been, um, you know, just take it in stride and just be, you know, thankful for that you get to do it every day. Yeah. And, you know, you've had, you know, kind of an interesting journey to get to where you are now too. Is like, I remember you were on um, Andrew Quatrian's podcast and you were talking about how you got cut from the U19 team, but within a year of that, you were like, you earned a full cap for the seniors team or playing at the ARC. So like, what, what would like, can you just like maybe talk a little bit about your journey and how it's been maybe, you know, some of the similarities or maybe some of the, the uniquenesses of how you've came to rise to the, uh, the national team versus some other guys that have, you know, maybe didn't have, you know, necessarily the same route as what you took to get there. Especially some of the guys that went through like the U sports kind of Avenue it's very interesting to compare them between what you, where you went through and how some of the guys went kind of straight out of high school or university. Uh, yeah. So I never um, really had plans to go to university. I was going to probably do more like the trades route um, was kind of what I was thinking, kind of come from that bit of a background uh, back home. So it was never really my plan to, you know, kind of work my way through that system. And to be honest, I don't think back in like 2015, there was really a big pathway um, from university into the program either. Um, it was basically, um, if you're from, you know, the East coast of Canada, you basically move out to BC to try and play in the, the BC premier league. And, you know, that's kind of the only way that you could have done it back then. There was no, um, you know, there was no MLR academies like what they have now or, um, you know, anything like that. It was, you know, pack your bags, move to the other side of the country and, Good luck, you know what I mean? for the best. Yeah. But, um, no, it was definitely, like, the story about getting cut, yeah. Um, I was actually playing for Burnaby at the time um, in, the for the in like, the Premier League out in in BC. And, uh, you know, I was doing all right. It was kind of, you know, I come from a town, you know, like, the town that I live in or from is about 4,000, but the little spot I'm actually from has got about 250 people in it. Um. So you go from that to living in Vancouver, you know, it's a bit of a shell shock. Never been on a city bus before, you know, stuff like that that you just maybe don't realize that uh, is a bit different. And and basically, yeah, I went to a, a, an identification camp, um, did okay. Then I moved home after just because I wasn't really enjoying myself um, in the Burnaby setup. Just, you know, it wasn't a good fit for me at the time. And, you know, I came back out for another tryout um, in Toronto you know, three or four months later and probably wasn't uh, in the best shape. I, I probably was when I first did. So it's partially on me, but I do think I got, you know, maybe the short end of the stick too. Um, I feel like sometimes some of those selectors, you know, they, they're a little bit biased to people from where uh, their province, you know, <laughs> which is fine. Like that it's, uh, it's, you know, it's fine. Everybody has their, their favorites <laughs> and stuff, but maybe I feel like that, but I mean, it was definitely partially on me too, probably coming back a little unfit. Um, into that, uh, the second try for the selection, but yeah, so. So we're going to, we're going to shift gears now. Um, we're going to kind of talk about your world cup experience. Um, so for anyone who's listening and doesn't know, which if you're listening to this podcast, you'll know who Cole is, but, uh, he was part of, uh, rugby Canada's roster for the 2019 world cup and Cole, the 2019 world cup we kind of saw was probably one of the most unique experiences out of all the World Cups we've had in, in, in quite a long time. And my question to you is, what was the country of Japan like itself? Because, you know, I think Rugby Canada did a, did a good job of kind of updating, you know, family and, and fans of what you guys kind of went through. But uh, tell us a little bit about what, like, the experience of Japan was like, especially from, you know, a guy talking about he, went, he lives in, you know, a town of 200 people or 500 people. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was uh, – Japan was amazing. Um, it was the whole country was just all, you know, gung ho for the for the World Cup. Um, the people there just embraced it. And like everywhere you went, there was posters, there were signs, there was like, like somewhat advertising of it, of the event going on. But even just, uh, you know, a few of us would just walk down the street in the middle of the day just to go check it out. And then there'd be, you know. 10 people stop you that day and, you know, say like Canada rugby, you know, and then ask for a picture, just say like, good luck or something like that. So 
it was awesome. Um, the food there was great. The people were amazing. All the, uh, the host cities and the, the liaisons that we had were, you know, they did um, an amazing job. There was, you know, nothing, nothing I could really compare it to. It was just so professional. So, so just spot on with everything they did. So I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't know if you could even uh, compare it to another world cup, but it was definitely a, a very special and uh, unique experience. Now, while in Japan, you got the chance to play against two of the best teams in the world. How does that feel for a young player like yourself? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's humbling, definitely. Um, but it's, it's awesome, too. You know, I, um, I don't usually, you know, I always think that I can, you know, or I always think I should be playing all the games, you know, just the, the confidence I have in myself, kind of. Um, but uh, the thing is, uh, that summer... Um, I did my, my shoulder and I uh, did the AC joint in my shoulder back in the July test matches. And uh, I played a game and played very poor against Tonga when I came off the bench. And for the rest of the summer, I never played a match uh, for Canada. And, and then uh, we get to Japan, trained well, you know, just did everything like, you know, decent. And uh, I didn't actually get named in the Italy team, which was the first game we played and uh, didn't get named in that team. And uh, the day the day before, uh, Jake, he went out with a, a hamstring injury. And uh, so I got, you know, took, took his spot on the bench and, you know, went on with about 30 minutes left uh, in the game and, uh, you know, scrummaged well played, you know, played an, an okay game, thought I did, uh, thought I did my role well, uh, which was good. And then um, that's all, all you really, you know, trying to do is just do your job and everybody else will kind of look after themselves. Um, and then the game after obviously was the all blacks. And I kind of remember, um, cause you have a pretty good idea. You know, you think you're going to play a game. You think you might not, um, based off your previous performance. And I'm kind of, I remember it was the team announcement day and, uh, we're sitting in the, the meeting room and, uh, you know, we're going on and I'm kind of sitting there like thinking, you know, yeah, like I might get a, uh, you know, like a, on the bench for the All Blacks or something. And it was just, that was always the game that I think everybody on the team looked forward to as well, just because of who they are. And then I just remember it was kind of popped up on the screen that, you know, I was the starting that game. And then it was just, you know, kind of all a blur after that for the rest of the, uh, <laughs> for the rest of the meeting, you know, I couldn't have told you who was, who else was playing um, that game. And then to be honest, we had like a little pre training meeting and I probably didn't, you know, take in one thing that was said the whole time because I was just kind of, you know, excited, nervous and, you know, just happy, you know. So that was kind of how that went. But So in, in playing a couple of those games, you got to, you know, with the All Blacks, with Italy and, you know, even even maybe even with the Springboks as well. But like what – like, did, were you able to, like, what were the post-match like for those? And maybe, like, were you even, like, were you able to, you know, take, like, talk to some of the, you know, the tight head props from, like, the Tier 1 nations there and maybe, you know, take something that you can, like, learn and bring and apply to your game here back in Major League Rugby or back um, with the Canadian national team going into, like, the the ARC or, you know, hope the next international tournament that Canada has to play. Hopefully that's sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I Against uh, against Italy, there wasn't much. Against the All Blacks was actually really cool. Um, they invited us in um, to their room after, had a couple beers and stuff um, with a few of those guys and just, yeah, mingled, chatted to a few of them. Just, you know, got to know uh, a couple of the guys. But no, there was no real um, – kind of when the game's over, everybody just kind of comes in and there's not much uh, rugby talk going on after, mostly just – seeing what they're going to get up to, you know, that night or seeing how they, uh, how they like enjoy Japan and, and uh, some of the things they've done so, so far in the country and the stories they've had and just, yeah, just, you know, chatting and then just, uh, you know, mingling and, and just doing that stuff. Not much, not much rugby talk goes on after, after the game. So. Uh, yep. Fair enough. And um, so when you kind of look back on it out of curiosity, what is like, obviously, uh, like what is your favorite memories of the world cup, whether it be something that happened on the pitch, say like playing the all blacks or, you know, something that happened off the pitch, maybe, you know, going out on, you know, on the town with the boys or, you know, anything else that you guys kind of did while you were in Japan, say on like an off day or something like that. 
Um, yeah, there's probably a few things that aren't uh, as PG, so I probably shouldn't say them. <laughs> but uh, not necessarily no, a PG was... podcast, though. So it's, I'll leave is the door a, open. Is to it you. a PG podcast or no? No, we're we, we're open to being whatever whatever <laughs> the people no, want. I, should, uh, I feel no, like the people no. want you to tell stories. No, they're in the vault for life. I can't. Uh, I can't. I don't can't. know if the teammates would appreciate some of the stories. Maybe Wait in for the autobiography. Yeah, in thirty years. Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, probably like the highlight for me, um, like you said, as crazy as this is, is, you know, sitting in that room when you're, you get announced for the All Blacks and then um, just the whole experience of that day, kind of. Um, and even the night before, it was just that whole, you know, 24 hours prior to the game. Um, it was just like I could pretty much remember everything that happened. Um, I remember in our room, I was rooming with Eric Howard. And, you know, he had the, there was like an AC system or something going on in the room. And then, but I woke up or that night I was kind of getting a little runny nose and I thought I was getting sick. And then I was freaking out that I wasn't going to be able to play, <laughs> but it was just like the dry air coming into the room. And, um, but just the experience, you know, rocking up there, Pack stadium. And then, you know, seeing the Hawker, that's a, um, obviously a huge one as well. And then, you know, playing the game and, you know, hanging out with them after having a few beers and, uh, and the, yeah, so definitely just that whole uh, 24 hours of the All Blacks uh, match is the, the highlight for me, for sure. And maybe one more thing that's kind of, kind of ties into Major League Rugby and kind of the World Cup as well. Um, earlier this week, uh, Springbok, uh, loose head prop, Old Glory DC, Tende, the beast into Warira, he was on Major League Rugby kickoff and he was asked about, you know, the scrums in Major League Rugby. And when he was discussing that, he mentioned that the referees in Major League Rugby are kind of clueless. Uh, is what he said as oh, far yeah, as that. Oh, that. <laughs> so you're kind of laughing. So um, basically my question for you is one, do you kind of agree with what he said there? And two, when you were at the world cup or when you've been at other major international competitions, do you like say like the ARC or the repishage tournament have, did you notice like a difference between the way the scrum is officiated versus the game in major league rugby? Um, yeah. So part one of that, um, yeah, I don't think that uh, I, I agree with what he says, but I also think that, you know, the old glory scrum was pretty poor as well. You know, like he's one of the best scrummagers in the world, but you know, when it's eight on one, what can you do? Right. Like, I mean, but it is, um, it is inconsistent at times. Um, I think that they do have like a few refs that come in. They're not as knowledgeable, maybe, you know, um, like for an example, we played Atlanta this year. Um, scrum was purely dominant the whole day um, and then the next week we're playing Glendale who has a poor scrum as well and uh, there's the ref comes into the sheds before the game and basically tells us you know like tries to tell us how to scrummage and that he's like looking for certain things to penalize us on and you know as soon as you hear that you know you're just if he's telling you what he's looking to penalize you on then you know and it was a guy who I never even you know haven't seen him ref a game before but obviously they said that to him and it's just, it is inconsistent at times. Um, but I think it's inconsistent around the scrum in, t in general, like ARC. I don't think those guys have a lot of knowledge on it either. Um, I think you really have to get into like the, the uh, you know, grade A, like first choice uh, officials around the world until like the, those guys, you know, Nigel Owens, you know, uh, Wayne Barnes, those guys, Twat, they, they understand it. Um, probably the most obviously because of you know their their experience and everything but um, they definitely officiate it different and probably a little bit more consistent I just think the consistency is the thing that frustrates players um, the most because one one scrum you can do this the next one you get dinged for it and then back and forth but definitely agree but I mean well, your new scrum is really poor, you know, blaming the refs probably isn't the, the best thing to do. You yeah, probably... don't, don't throw rocks when you're, when you're in a glass house, that's for sure. Well, I mean, you should probably blame your scrum coach if you're getting, <laughs> you're getting so, I don't know. Well, you know what, Cole, we're going to move on because, uh, but we're going to transition a little bit to uh, your time with the Arrows. Um, you know, <clears throat> when you came into the season, the, the, the shortened 2020 season, you were one of the best – uh, guys in your position um do you think that the 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 minutes you played at the world cup played a part in how strong your 2020 season was um i mean yeah definitely helped um you know 
just those experiences, they're, they're invaluable, right? You know, and even if you don't think you learn anything, you still pick little things up. Um, Muscle so it's, memory. Yeah, it's just um, definitely all those things that um, leads into it. So, like, I'm still, you know, I'm, I mean, I learn every day, every game, basically. You know, maybe just a feel thing, just a setup thing, just something, you know, that, uh, um, you know, Boris, our scrum coach for the Canadian team for the World Cup, maybe he shows me something different than Butch, who's a great, very knowledgeable in the scrums as well. He shows me something different, and then maybe you can combine them, and it, and it works for you. But yeah, definitely, um, I would definitely say it helped for sure, hundred percent. It did. I think it helped probably everybody who went just to the, that experience and getting to play against that uh, competition. So, and the arrows have gone from strength to strength from twenty nineteen, like winning games and losing games on the road to having four straight victories on the road in twenty twenty. Uh, what do you think is in store then for twenty twenty one? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, there's no signs why it shouldn't be any different, really. I think we're going to keep, uh, we should keep rolling, you know, kind of the way we were. I mean, we had that, that one loss against, um, uh, Glendale there this past year, but I mean, that's, that's whatever, but I think, yeah, um, you know, most of the boys are back. I think there's only one or two that aren't returning and, uh, you know, but we've also, you know, thrown a couple, um, you know, big names in there as well to replace them. So I'm sure those guys will fit in great, um, and everything and like we have just such a strong uh a group there like we're really tight knit you know um you get into some teams and it's a little clicky you know some people hang out with some people and with this group everybody is all uh you know we all like we all enjoy each other's company and we all get on really well with each other which i think is a a huge part of it so i mean yeah looking to keep it rolling from uh, where 2020 left off so what you're saying is when you get back to Toronto, you'll be going to play some polo with uh, Leandro Livas? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, I know Taylor Adams, he's been up there a few times. Uh, Tommy, he's been there with him a bit. But, uh, I mean, I'd definitely give it a go if uh, Leandro <laughs> can, can, can hook the boys up with a, maybe a little bit of a deal on the price, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe that's what we got to do next MLR offseason instead of the video game tournament. We'll get a round. Yeah, so we'll a polo teams. We'll tournament. Do, yeah, we'll do yeah. a polo tournament. Yeah. <laughs> and then, what, like, yeah, I don't know, man. I haven't seen any other teams with players playing polo in the offseason on social media. So maybe yeah. the arrows might have an edge in that competition. It could be, yeah. It could be a little uh, a little uh, secret for us, maybe. So yeah. there you go. Exactly. Maybe try having horses play the wing now, too, I guess. That might, <laughs> yeah. Maybe they give you yeah, a pretty much edge. a horse on the wing now, anyway, with that. Uh, 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 sorry, I can't even think of his name, the Argentinian. Manuel though. Montero. Is Manuel, it? yeah. He's pretty much the size of a horse, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. So within saying that too, obviously the Arrows have made a number of really big acquisitions this year, Montero being one of them. You know, Juan Cruz Gonzalez, Siaki Vicky Lani, um, the Adrian Wadden, um, probably, uh, and um, Gaston Cortez uh, as another tight head prop. Is there, you know, is there anybody that you've seen like that have been brought into the squad that you're like really excited to play with or to, you know, meet at practice or um, anything like that? Um, yeah, n nobody um, in particular, you know, looking forward to just, you know, meeting all the new guys and, and uh, hanging out with them. And I'm sure they're all, you know, going to be great guys and stuff. And, uh, but no, nobody in particular. Um, I'm interested to, uh, uh, I guess, yeah, I should be saying I'm interested to meet uh, Gaston Cortez, you know, maybe pick his brain a little bit, um, you know, see, uh, see how he goes about things and, you know, probably learn a bit from him, hopefully, and just see, you know, how he's uh, had his career because he's been uh you know very successful over in uh in Europe for the last decade so uh definitely yeah excited to meet him and just you know see uh you know pick his brain a bit hopefully throughout the season and just see uh see what he has to say so yeah and you kind of touched on it with one of your earlier answers there too was with you know there is a couple guys that are on the way out most notably Dan Moore and Sam Malcolm Dan Moore obviously kind of being the the team captain there the uh, the immense like leadership ability that um that he had that he brought to the team so you know obviously I guess Montero kind of looks like to be his replacement as far as his position and on the field but like how do you guys as a team go about replacing say the leadership that Dan Moore brought now that he won't necessarily be in the locker room on a daily basis um yeah I mean he obviously yeah Dan he's a great leader um you know the boys you know when he spoke listened um and that's kind of the big thing you know led by example too um he but I mean it's always uh I think that it was more you know it's a committee as well you know 
there's a lot of great leaders in the team. You know, Andrew Quatrin, um, he's a great leader. Um, I, I like pretty close with him as well. But um, just an example, there's him. There's uh, you know, there's there's multiple. There's probably you know five or six guys in the room that could probably be the skipper, right? Um, and it's just you know, uh, you know, losing Dan's big, but I you know, I'm uh, you know, I got full, full confidence. Whoever you know gets the uh, gets the job at skip next, so. Uh, I'm sure somebody will fill his shoes and they'll do uh, just as good a job as uh, as Dano did for us. So one of, one of our questions too is, what's it been like dealing with the management and the coaching team during your time with Arrows? You know, Bill Webb, Mark Winokur, Chris Silverthorne, you know, Bill's just been super active in the community and yeah. stuff like that, uh, you know, uh, talking with fans and stuff like that. But we want to, want to hear from your perspective, from the player's perspective. You know, what are these guys been like, especially, you know, when you've got, you know, Canada's most capped player as one of your coaches. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Bill, he's the he's the man. You know, he's uh, he's he's awesome. He does, uh, like you said, he's very active in the community, um, and basically, he's just so for the boys. You know, you need anything to, uh, you know, help yourself uh, get better, to help the team get better, and he's uh, he's on board a hundred percent with uh, with whatever needs to be done to, uh, you know improve the improve yourself as a player which is huge and you know that gives you a lot of confidence you know seeing as the the boss basically um is just there for you no matter what um so uh and yeah just in general um you know the coaches it's good it was a it was a lot better this year um it was a little smoother obviously you know year two um it was uh, everything kind of you know started smoother there wasn't as many you know kinks and stuff that needed worked out and that's probably also you know reflects on our record from the start of the year as well um you know instead of being uh you know two and two after four games you know we're four and oh or you know whatever you know and so um but yeah the the coaching staff's good it's uh mark winnaker he's good you know we give him a lot of flack you know he's kind of the uh i wouldn't, I wouldn't say whipping boy but uh when he takes a lot of uh he gets he gets uh chirped and made fun of a lot but uh, he's good. He likes it. So uh, he's uh, and he's good at his job too, despite the fact that we're all constantly, you know, you get 30, 30 guys asking him for stuff every day, you know, and he, he does, he does, he does it good. So yeah, no, definitely, definitely a solid group of, uh, you know, ownership and uh, coaches and everything. So this is your little brainchild and, and it, it kind of popped up on my Twitter feed uh, uh, randomly. Well, one day and you kind of brought up the idea of Canada running in kind of either a series or a game where they put, you know, uh, two kind of all-star teams, the East versus the West, you know, we're going to kind of dive in a little bit at it because it's your brain shell, but why do you think this is exhibition game or series is such a good idea for Canada right now? Um, I don't know. Like, um, I just thought like, just like kind of going back even a little farther. I was just like, that was the week the North South game was being played. And I just kind of, you know, sitting uh, on my couch one morning and I got to watch the sports center or something. And I was like, how much fun would it be, you know, if we had like a similar thing, um, you know, um, it'd just be uh, enjoyable. It'd be fun to, uh, to just play against, you know, some teammates and some other guys and kind of compare yourself. But I think it would be good as well, just as a, as a selection tool, you know, um, guys, you know, MLR is a good selection Obviously, it's going to be great to, you know, see guys, get guys time. But um, I think, yeah, just it would be good to see every single person in Canada kind of on the same system um, and just, you know, let them go out there and, and, and play against each other just to see, you know, who can who can do what, basically. So. And I also, sorry, yeah, sorry. I think it would be sick, too, if it was like a series, you know, a little two-game uh, aggregate uh, series, you know, play one year out, uh, out West, play one year East or something. If we could get it going, have a little rival rivalry, that'd be, uh, that'd be fun, but that's, uh, might be a little far fetched. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you, would you prefer a one match or a series? But yeah, I definitely. Think I, think, I, think, that question. I think a two match, yeah. Two match, uh, series, maybe on aggregate wins it. I think that's, uh, that's kind of what I thought of anyway. So. Okay. Well, last week uh, we came up with um, our teams of who we'd like to see in the East versus West match, but we had some restrictions and so did our friend Brian Ray at uh, America's Rugby News. So, for example, they said that no players over the age of 30 
Um, <laughs> would you want to have something like an age limit on things to, in an idea of like promoting younger players, or would you rather say anyone's eligible if they can come to Canada and play? Yeah, no, I'd like to do um, anybody, you know, just basically purely best on best. Um, I think because it would be used as a selection tool for, you know, that year of uh, of test matches, basically, or the, the, the next uh, series or tour, whatever we're going to play. And so, you know, you get a guy, you know, Kieran Hearn, who's, you know, over 30, you know, he might still be one of the best centers we have in Canada. He probably is. Um, so I would like, I would like it. Yeah. Just best on best, you know, compare yourself to, you know, who you're trying to take a position, um, you know, so just compare yourself against everybody else in Canada was kind of my thought. I didn't think any, any age limit or, uh, or anything like that. Just, you know, go out and play and, and uh, compare yourself to the other potential best player in the, in the nation uh, of your position. So. Uh, would you want to, see like the overseas pros or any of the players playing overseas or are you more would you want to keep it just kind of the domestic say you know guys playing maybe like U sports or any other or pride or something as well as the mlr like basically keep it as north american based players or would you want to allow guys like say tyler ardron or will persilier to play if they were available um yeah definitely i'd want them to play like you said like just pure best on best because it's a it's used as a as a selection tool for us to, you know, win test matches, not, not a development match. You know, you could have the development matches, but I think um, to get the most out of it, you'd want to play best. Not. I just said in that tweet, you know, we have to be domestic um, just because right now, you know, realistically, yeah. those yeah. guys, could yeah. but you know, in the future, yeah, just if those guys are released from their club or, or what it is best on best, you know, get uh, anybody who's eligible that, you know, could have a chance uh, around the world to, to play in it and uh and yeah and then just you know let us go out and and uh and play around so um i think yeah best on best anybody anybody could play so and so with that with that in mind then obviously there's a lot of your own toronto arrows teammates are from out west so who would you like to most match up against in that East first West game or which one of your arrows teammates would you most likely to maybe land a really hard hit on or something during <laughs> that game? Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Uh, if he wasn't on our team, I'd probably say DJ just cause you know, we're pretty good buddies, but, uh, but he, on he would West, be on the East uh, team for this game. Though. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. But uh, I don't know if there's anybody in particular that you'd really want to, lay one on uh it's hard to say but i just think going out and, and playing against each other would just be fun uh, be a fun be a fun week just leading up to it training together and, and uh it'd just be a good time so at the very least would you use this game as an opportunity to show us that you can in fact beat giuseppe de Troyes in a speed test <laughs> listen i don't know who was it Stu that said that he wanted him on the wing that, it was. It was definitely yeah. Stu. Me and Dan will happily throw this <laughs> idea of Stu under the bus. Yeah. If you guys ever need confirmation, ask Taylor Adams about the time in training where I ran past Giuseppe and he couldn't. We were just playing a game of touch and he couldn't. He couldn't chase me. That like we started same spot and he couldn't get me. And I beat the, he's the, the slowest guy. Probably he's the slowest back probably in the world. Like <laughs> it's and I'm not even joking. You know what? We're not gonna make you. Uh, we're not gonna make you list off two two full rosters, uh, Cole. But I, I do want you to name your East pack because uh, that is that is a. We had a tough time. You know, we had all a bunch of different answers on on who we wanted. So I want you to at least name your Eastern team pack. Uh, who are you yeah. gonna go to war with in, in the trenches? Um. Yeah, I saw I saw Brian Ray's thing that he put on. I kind of thought about it too. Um. I don't know. Probably, I think you guys nailed it at the front row. I go DJ Q and me. Um, I just probably pick Q um, <clears throat> over Howie a little bit, maybe just on form. I don't really know what Howie's been up to lately. I haven't really spoken to him. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, either one of those two guys would be great to have there. Um, and then yeah, I mean, I uh, I actually rate uh, Paulie pretty pretty highly. Paul Cellini. Um, you know, he doesn't get a lot of credit. He does a lot of the uh, he does a lot of the hard yards in there that nobody really notices, um, and so definitely him at lock. Um, 
and you know it's nice having a 135 kg guy pushing behind you as well <laughs> um, makes but, life a little easier yeah <laughs> no but uh and then i don't know um you know you got keezy you know he's been he's been in good form lately chef obviously you know what you're gonna get from him every time um so you know either one of those two you know it's uh it depends on the day basically who's gonna play better so either one of those at the lock and then uh um, I wrote this out last week, actually, I had, a, I had a team list in my head. I don't know. I had, yeah, I had Bailey Heaton and uh, Rumble, um, in the back row, I think. I don't, I think, I don't really care. Uh, I think Heaton's probably, <laughs> I think Heaton's probably a seven, Rumble six and put Bales at eight maybe. Or, uh, you could probably switch, uh, Rumble and, uh, and, and Kyle, uh, whatever you want to do basically, but probably those three in the back row, so. Um, I don't know. I feel like that'd be a pretty scary pack, uh, you know, for against anybody in North America. So it'd be, it'd be fun to do. Definitely. But. Now you got to explain to us the whole snack pack thing. Cause Andrew co tweeted <laughs> at our little surprise, you know, who's coming on our show. And, and he, he mentioned that you're a snack pack member. What, what does that even mean? Yeah. So basically it's probably the, one of the most sought after um, groups to be involved in, in probably rugby Canada. Um, there's four of us, me, DJ, Matt Tierney, and Eric Howard. And uh, basically, you know, what's more enjoyable than after, you know, a, a Tuesday training session where you got the scrum session, malls, gym, and then a team defense session, then, uh, you know, going to the store, buying a bunch of snacks and hanging out in the room, eating them, right? <laughs> so, you know, we're the snack pack. We, uh, you know, we, we go around from country to country, buying snacks from, you know, different little shops and stuff. And, uh, that's how we, uh, that's how we bond together. But I know, uh, there's been a few boys that have tried to, uh, to get into the, into the club, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty tough to do. So you got to really earn your way to, uh, to get into this. And actually Andrew Coe wants into the snack pack too, but he's not even close. He's like 90 kilos. So you got to be over one, one ten to 112 to even have a sniff. So. <laughs> See, that makes a lot more sense because I thought you guys were talking about pudding, like yeah, snack no. pack puddings. I'm like, no, why no. is putting so more now now it makes a little bit more sense there's four of us that yeah and, and dj is the snack king you know he, he weighs 130 kilos and i've never seen a guy be able to eat a bag of you know cheetos in like two minutes other than <laughs> him actually a story about that the guy we were at um some grocery store and he bought a bag of like bakery cookies and he was eating them like popcorn but i'm not even joking he had like six cookies gone before he even paid for my stuff and so <laughs> He's, he's kind of the ringleader. He, he, he's the one who, uh, who got, got all of us on it. So it's, uh, it's his credit. All right. So well, I guess a little bit of a follow-up to that. What is, what is your go-to snack? Say either that post training on the road, maybe on a flight, like what, what's yeah, well, the go-to? We, we have to be pretty stealthy about it though, because, uh, you know, the strength coaches and the nutritionists don't really, uh, <laughs> so, but, uh, Definitely none of that on the flights usually. Usually it's like we're closet snackers. We sneak out at night after dinner and, you know, sometimes we have to send somebody in to see if anybody's sitting in the lobby and then we, we run back into our rooms and, and eat them. But uh, I don't know, best snack, you know, it's it's a mood thing. Some days, you know, you're feeling, you know, a little you know, like, a, like a salty snack or something. Some days you want something sweet. So it, uh, it all kind of depends. When you were in Japan, was there any snack you had over there that you just can't have in Canada? Or? Oh, there were so many things. The the Seven Elevens in Japan were insane. There was we bought well, actually, we probably bought so many snacks and that were just disgusting that we thought looked really good. But <laughs> they did have some crazy stuff. There's just everything in Japan is a little crazy, but they definitely they had some good ones. Uh, uh, yeah, they they were a good country for it. So, man. What uh, is I, the best country for snacks then outside of America? Outside of America? Yeah, I, oh, yeah. yeah they, you literally, anything you could ever dream of is a thing there. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of gross to be honest. But yeah, they, just anything that you could ever even think of. Is, what grosses me out is like the cereal. Yeah, it's like you just get so many different flavors of cereal. And it's like you can, look, you can tell that's not good for you. And it's yeah, being like marketed to kids. <laughs> no they have some pretty crazy stuff there but france is good too france has good stuff but uh definitely definitely the states so. see i asked that question but the second he answered it i was like that's that was such an obvious that's yeah. such an obvious yeah. question to ask yeah <laughs> but, well yeah. colby we really appreciate you coming on buddy uh 
You know, we, we, your teammate Andrew Quatrin's got his little podcast side gig going on. Is there anything that, that you've got going on the fly that you want to kind of plug or you kind of just steady as she goes? Yeah, no, just pretty pretty steady as it goes. Nothing nothing too crazy happening uh, happening with me right now. Just hopefully uh, these games, you know, that uh, the Arrows are planning on having go through and stuff and uh, we'll, be out, uh, we'll be out playing and firing into the, the, the new season coming up this year. So. Well, we really appreciate you coming on, buddy. Stay, stay healthy, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on the pitch pretty soon. Awesome. Thanks, boys. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Well, guys, uh, I don't know about you, but that was a lot of fun. Uh, one of the best things about doing this podcast is we get to have conversations like that with, with guys like Cole, and it was, uh, that was a, a lot of fun for, for me, at least. Yeah, I thought it was a blast, man. He had a, had a couple funny answers. I like his take on the uh, the, the officiating of the scrums there. Um, little, uh, I like finding out, you know, I even like finding out like little things about like, you know, what the guys are like kind of off the pitch when they're together. So it was like that snack pack story and stuff. It's great to hear. Um, and All I can yeah. think about is just like, like giant men trying to sneak around in a hotel just so they can leave, not to go out and party, not to go like chase women. It's to go get snacks because they're snacky. And that's after like a full meal where I'm sure that they were fed a lot too. It's like, I feel like my brothers and I used to do this as kids. So it's just, it's very heartwarming. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. It was great. It's working. It's working for them too, man. It's uh, no, like I, I don't blame guys like Andrew Cole for wanting to be a part of that. Like it's, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's working, it's working for like the four guys that are in it, man. They're at, they're at the top of their game right now. So um, I, don't, I don't blame guys for wanting to be a part of that. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, it's great talking to them. Um, yeah. You know, I think going into this, into uh, this season, like, man, it was, it was so short, um, which is very unfortunate um, due to COVID, but like, I think like through the five games of the 2020 major league rugby season, I think Cole Keith was the best tight head prop in the league. Um, he had like every game he played was excellent. Um, you know, he came on kind of late in the loss to uh, Colorado, but um, the four games that he started and like, especially the game with um, Seattle and Atlanta were just unreal. Um, probably some of the best rugby that he's played um, and you know, like, I, I, like his 2020 season ends with five games played 311 minutes, um, 14 carries for 80 meters, 11 line, um, one line break, um, 39 tackles, 80 at 85%. Also had uh, 94 offensive ruck mall arrivals, 18 defensive ruck mall arrivals. Like, um, it's, you know, just his season was unreal. He had the that game where he was mentioning that uh, the scrum dominated Atlanta, he put in eighty an eight full eighty minute shift of that, and you know that was a game too where the arrows were trailing at halftime, and in the second half of the game it was the scrum, it was Cole Keith, um, kind of you know dominating Chance Wenglewski when Lu- when he came on. Um, as the loose head for Atlanta in the second half. And, you know, that was a big reason why the Toronto Arrows won that game and why they were able to come away with a bonus point as well. And same with that game against Seattle too. He was all over the pitch. He had, you know, his work rate in that game was oh, like just off the charts. It was exceptional. Um, he really is like one of like the bright young stars, I think in you know, for rugby Canada. And I I can't wait to see what he does with the, you know, with the rest of his career, as far as, you know, he's got to get a couple more full MLR seasons under his belt. Obviously there's nothing he can do about this year. Um, But I I don't see why he can't be like the go-to guy for the three Jersey for Canada um, as we uh, keep going forward. Yeah. Well, you said about uh, short and MLR season, but we were fortunate enough to see, uh, Cole play in the World Cup and for him to talk about his experiences being not only in Japan but um, like he's mentioned like his difficulties of being injured and then having to come back for injury in time for uh, the game against Italy and then being named to play against the All Blacks. I've been fortunate enough to see the All Blacks play. I've been fortunate enough to see the Hacker but obviously getting a front row seat of seeing the Hacker is a completely different experience. And, you know, I I think we all knew that was a game that uh, a draw at best would have been a fantasy in and of itself. But, 
you know, to get the experience of playing what was ranked the number one team in the world for over it for nearly a decade, not over a decade, sorry. That's Welsh and me coming through just to remind me of that. Um, but, you know, to play a team of that caliber is obviously going to rub off on you and you're going to get some experience from that. And I think, as you mentioned, Cole Keith was the best in his, in his position for this shortened MLR season. And I think playing at the World Cup has definitely helped him with that. Yeah, he, in the, in that game against the all uh, the All Blacks, you know, he's playing against Super Rugby, you know, capped uh, by the All Blacks, you know, props. So it's been quite the it was is quite the game for him to experience. That's for sure. Um, we've got a couple updates, guys, about some news that's been kind of happening in the last little bit. Uh, Derek, you had an up, uh, update about uh, uh, a uh, Argentinian player, Tuchlet, that we we kind of talked about a little bit. Um, in a previous episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last week we kind of mentioned, uh, you know, Paul Tate kind of on Twitter kind of brought up that uh, Joaquin Tuchelet may be heading to the arrows. Um, you know, after like it kind of seemed to kind of go back and forth. There's, uh, I would say there, there it sounds like there, you know, there's still maybe a couple teams that are interested, um, but the arrows are definitely, um, as I kind of said last week, I was, I thought the arrows might've been out of the running on Tuchelet. Um, but it sounds like that's absolutely not the case. And it sounds like there, you know, there's still some ongoing talks and the, you know, the possibility that he does still end up in Toronto, um, definitely still exists, which, you know, I kind of mentioned last week, like if it happens, it's just, you know, like we already have like two, like a, the arrows back line is unreal. Um, it's unreal already. Even if the no other moves are made, um, this would be like another insane depth move. Um, it's, it's a move that it's like, you know, the, the arrows have a ton of depth and, you know, if this move happens, it's probably going to mean that there's a really talented player that's not getting as much playing time as they might um, deserve. But you know, too much depth isn't necessarily a bad thing to have either. So it's something to kind of keep an eye on. Um, I guess we'll we'll see what ultimately happens in the end. But um, you know, there's uh, I don't this story is not the story is not necessarily over yet. So um, you know, there's still there's still a chance that it happens, and uh, I guess we'll just kind of have to wait and see what actually does transpire here. Now, guys, there's been a lot of rumors that. Um, USA Rugby, uh, with conjunction with some help with MLR, are putting a bid in for the 2027 World Cup or the next World Cup, which would be 2031, if I'm correct. Yeah, 2027 and 2020 and 2031. So 2023 is France, it's France. and obviously yes. only three years out. So that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. You would assume they had that plan. You would assume that they got that locked down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but so my question to you guys is. Let's say, yes, the World Cup is coming to North America and is coming to the U.S. Um, where would you and how would you like it to be set up in terms of where the teams are playing? Because, you know, with NFL stadiums, there are a lot of venues that are um, sized properly. So there is a little bit of flexibility in terms of where they could play. And then they also have some places like... Uh, you know, Glendale or Houston that have proper rugby pitches, um, a little bit smaller, mind you. Um, but where would you like the USA World Cup to be played if it ever does happen? Yeah, well, go ahead, Stu. Go ahead. I'll let you go first. Um, well, I remember our friend Brian Ray has done a number of articles about a hypothetical World Cup coming to North America in general, never mind just the US, and he said that he would like it based around travel hubs, so airport hubs for major airlines. If a deal was made with the Star Alliance group, then that would, you know, tick multiple boxes. So there's always going to be, you know, the big East Coast cities, so like New York and New Jersey, I feel, um, with like MetLife Stadium would uh, be a good shout. There's also LA and even, now I'd say this World Cup would take place in 2031, instead of 2027 but in 2028 is going to be the olympic games in la which would mean a lot of infrastructure changes one of the big ones being uh, the coliseum in uh, la so that would be good old uh, the guiltini's home 
Yeah, exactly. Um, you mentioned uh, Colorado. There you go. What did that? We can all we can deck that out. A eh? World Cup finals have a big LA Giltinis logo somewhere in the background the entire time. Yeah, they're gonna have DT, DTH serving drinks, serving people <laughs> Giltinis. There um, we go. That's there we go. See, <laughs> now we've been you know people have been making fun of it, but there's some you know the Giltini becomes the official drink of the World Cup of the 2031 United States Rugby World Cup. I hate this. What so did much. that? Would that be the turn of events right there? Stu, eh? keep going because he's making um, me mad. So the idea was that, um, you mentioned about Glendale, and as we know from previous World Cups, there are going to be games where it's going to be two tier two nations that say so don't have the appeal of like England or the All Blacks, and they're not going to sell out um, a um, you know uh, American football stadium. They'll need a smaller venue. And I think uh, Infinity Park would be a fantastic uh, venue for that. And then I would like uh, a few games uh, in Toronto or Vancouver. Now, you, uh, those who've done geography will note that those aren't in the United States. I would also like to point out that the Millennium Stadium isn't in England, and yet that was part of the 2015 Rugby World Cup. So, you know, deals can be made. And can you just imagine being in, say, oh, I don't know, the Sky Dome, and because of uh, World Cup rules, the roof has to be closed, and there are 50,000 fans joining in to sing Oh Canada as Canada play any team, any team at all. Can you imagine the rugby pride that comes through for that? I think that would be absolutely fantastic. A very financially beneficial incentive to any bid wink wink to uh, be done yeah um i think man i think one if if any stadium in toronto is hosting a uh, a world like were to host a world cup game it's got to be bmo um or i mean something else that gets built between now and 2031 because i think the sky dome is one of those stadiums that you know i'm from toronto so i have like the fond memories of it but it's like if you have ever traveled to other sports stadiums around north america you kind of realize where the sky dome kind of ranks on that um that is like it's like it is what it is man it's it's a slab of concrete that has a roof that was super cool in the 80s um and like that's kind of what it is so i would think like you might want to you know maybe put it in a little bit more of an updated facility um i would put it in beam over the sky dome if that's just my kind of if we're talking toronto um but or even like bc place in vancouver man that's a state-of-the-art one that world rugby clearly already likes they put the seven series in that or so tim like, horton's field and hamilton tim horton yeah tim horton's field too but then that's people nice field. but then you have to bring people of the world to hamilton um <laughs> how many people went to small town places in japan i mean like yeah that's true exactly it's true know? i don't know that's just the toronto the toronto thing right you always have to Hamilton is actually a great city. We just kind of rip on it a little bit for no reason sometimes. Don't like, drive there with me. Yeah, don't drive there with Dan. Don't drive anywhere with Dan. Dan is the worst driver. Um, I'm a uh, fine driver. I'm not good at navigating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll go with, we'll go with that. Um, were you scared for your life when you were in my car, Derek? Is that what you were saying? No, I wasn't. So, well, no, because you were like, we're going too slow to warrant being terrified. Oh, my life. God. <laughs> I'm going to take a pee on this one because I have no idea. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, but you know what? In all honesty, uh, yeah, I would take Tim Hortons Field. Tim Hortons Field, brand new. Um, that's, and you know what? Like, it worked out really well for that Canada versus Leinster game. Um, so I would say that I would put that even above the Sky Dome um, for me. Just, I mean, if we're talking Toronto, if we're talking Toronto, like, or Southern Ontario, I guess, for Hamilton. Um, yeah, we got to kind of do that. Um, like, yeah, the Sky Dome, I would rank down. Um, kind of other things that the Stu sort of touched on there. I think, you know, there are some, I guess, the rugby specific stadiums, but like, what's Infinity Park's capacity? 5,000? That's still way too small um for for a uh, world cup game even the how many that... people were at that the uruguay fiji game that that stadium where where canada was supposed to play their last game against namibia i don't think that it was a very big stadium let me uh, like let you guys it, talk it up I'm, while I'm still it. talking and let me know either, if it's probably it's got to be higher than five thousand people either way um, there's always even eden park had extra seating put in for the 2011 world cup final i don't think it's out of yeah, the yeah no you could do to that. add an extra 
few thousand. It depends on the, st- the structure of the stadium. Um, I think obviously you kind of are like obviously airport travel is important no matter what. You'd expect kind of the really big American cities like like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, um, will all be will all be hosting games. That would just be an assumption. Um, the one thing though, I suggested Cowboy Stadium. Um, on Twitter and then Dan Power kind of quickly um, uh, rebutted it by saying like it's it's re- it's too small and obviously the artificial turf it's too small like the pitch is too small Dan not like the mm. stadium is too small okay. and that kind of actually brought me back to kind of thinking too is I went to the Toronto Arrows um, I went to the Toronto Arrows versus Rugby United New York that sort of scrimmage thing that they did in Buffalo and I like I've never been to an NFL game um, and growing up in Canada, like all our high all our sports fields are CFL sized. Right. So they're all like, for the most part, they're all the CFL, CFL dimensions or the soccer dimensions, multi-sport fields, like at high schools and stuff are all super wide to accommodate soccer and rugby and CFL football, which plays on a wider stadium or a wider field and walking on to the practice pitch at, in Buffalo, I was like, like my first thought was, was like, man, this is tiny, right? Like not kind of actually realizing how much smaller or how much like narrower an NFL field is versus like a CFL one. Um, and it's kind of a noticeable difference to the point where like when at the end of the practice, Rooney and Toronto did like a scrimmage against each other. And instead of playing the length of the field, they played the width of the field. Or they like they played like they put the tri zones on the sidelines and then they put like a cone at like the 30 yard line on one to kind of be like this is the out of bounds because that's how wide like a rugby pitch would be so they that's how they played so that everybody could get their width properly they played on the shorter field as opposed to squeezing guys in on the narrow uh, on like a narrow angle there um so for NFL stadiums, that is definitely something you have to consider. MLS stadiums might be a little bit more accommodating to that. And there's a lot of really great MLS stadiums throughout the country, a lot of new ones and stuff too. Also, like I feel like, you know, 10 years is a long time. And maybe that's part of your the plan somewhere. Maybe you can join forces with, say, an MLS team or something to that effect to be like, hey, like, can we – you know, we'll build like this stadium, we'll use it for the Rugby World Cup. And then, you know what, like it's your stadium after maybe kind of work in that a little bit. Or maybe you're even just looking at like, you know, the ultimate optimism here would be like the MLR really takes off and like MLR teams start warranting like their own like 20,000 seat stadiums, 20, 30,000 seat stadiums stuff, right? Um, maybe that's something. We've seen too like Seattle, the Seawolves seem to be doing great there. That seems to be like, you know, developing into a little bit of a rugby hotbed, at least from the commercial success of the Seawolves. Um, so maybe then you go with, um, you know, maybe you put a game at CenturyLink Field, man, because like in uh, in Seattle, get um get them. They, you can put a USA game there. Change the twelfth man flag to a sixteenth man flag. Um, do something like that, right? Um, you can kind of make that fun. Um, but I, like, yeah. So I think there's a lot of things to consider there. Um, but ultimately, I feel like you kind of got to go with like the biggest cities right because you're showcasing it to the world right so you know you don't necessarily want a uh, stadium in Fairbanks Alaska when you're hosting the you know the biggest uh, one of the biggest events in sports around the world so you're probably going um, like yeah you're probably going New York Chicago Los Angeles maybe Boston Um, although the Patriots don't actually play in Boston but um like that's Foxboro. Foxboro, yeah but like maybe you do that maybe you're looking at miami for a couple teams um yeah, you know i think that J- a little bit yeah exactly japan had 12 stadiums across their country right and you know maybe like even that like we're talking like nfl mls stadiums there's a lot of college football stadiums too that are how, how cool would it be even better like how cool would it be to see a, a usa game against insert opposing team in the big house in Ann Arbor where the university yeah. of Michigan play. But see, that's the thing though, too, is it's like, that, that's tough. See, that's tough. Cause it goes the other way. Right. where it's like, if Ann, Ann Arbor is what? 110,000 people. Like that's, that would be awesome. But that's, 
That's a goal to that's set. Very right? put, put, that's very yeah. yeah. Listen, you put you put hey, the you U.S. versus New Zealand or something like that. It, it'd be very interesting. I mean, they yeah. they sold out Soldier sh- Soldier Field, and that's got a capacity of sixty one thousand. So I'm not saying you couldn't. I'm not saying you couldn't do it. I'm just saying like that's like a hundred thousand, a hundred plus yeah. thousand people to watch a rugby yeah, think, game. Is I think the current like, world yeah. record attendance for an international was Ireland Romania in the 2015 rugby world cup because that was at wembley stadium that was yeah. over ninety thousand. okay so, so we're well, almost there <laughs> but that's yeah. it if you can get another what was it like 20 30 000 more people but i think that would have to be like a For big sure. interest game to have so but, that but maybe would maybe that's kind of be like ireland or the all blacks or anything with cultural england would be cultural. would be a really good uh, matchup but but even usa that, versus like, england you can really play that up yeah, okay i don't yeah. but, I think you could, but it's like maybe that's something that you like target, and maybe you market it as that, like a stadium to set the record for like the. Oh yeah, there, there's ways ways to do it, right? But maybe maybe that has to be like a uh, like a, maybe that has to be like a one off like pool stage game, like when you see the like take like we'll go back like let's just just for example like use the pools from like the 2019 World Cup just because we don't know what the draw is, although there's a lot of like controversy and everything about how they're actually doing that draw coming out of COVID with like Japan hasn't played a game since the World Cup and stuff, so they're dropping rankings when they normally wouldn't be because they would be playing games in COVID. Um, so World Rugby kind of has to figure some of that out too, and it's all very strange and weird. Um, but maybe like just to use the pools from the last world cup for the sake of argument, maybe that's something that you do. And maybe you go like all black spring box pool stage game. Right. And just for be sure. like, and you know, I'll see how many people you can get from um, New Zealand, South Africa to kind of go up there and do and you're that. right there in Canada. Canada is there close to like, I would make a yeah. drive to Ann Arbor to see that. Yeah, no, yeah, no, exactly. And I'm sure there's a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot of um, American fans and stuff that would um, do the exact same thing, but there's like other historic, like, I think like even that, like, I mean, okay. Like I I don't have the, um, like the NFL stadium guide in front of me. So I don't know what, like, I I know artificial turf is a a bit of a problem, a a bit of a problem. So I'm just kind of spitballing things without actually being like looking into it at the moment here. Um, But even like, wouldn't it be cool to kind of get some games to it, like super historical, like stadiums or something? Yeah, too? Fenway like, Park has a capacity of thirty. Yeah, but watching 000. rugby and baseball stadiums we've established is not the best. Um, ah. That's from some MLR things, but I mean, like even like would it be, would it be kind of cool to see someone play a game at like Lambeau Field or whatever? But I mean, that yeah. means going to that means going to Green Bay, right? With um, or I mean, right, Sam Boyd Stadium was... would be really cool in in Vegas with its history with the rugby sevens. That'd be really, yeah, really maybe you cool. do that. Um, you know what it's like yeah exactly what are you know like you said soldier field nice and historic the la coliseum has a little bit of that history yeah. um you know maybe even so maybe you do something like i mean i just chirped i just said baseball stadiums don't necessarily have the best sight line but i'll be like why not like yeah like you said fenway park yankee stadium do something fun like that um but again though like football football and full-size pit like i don't i feel like i wonder if a rugby pitch could kind of fit in that kind of could well i guess it can because we have like teams like nola and um rooney are playing on baseball field so i'm assuming it could fit in those stadiums too and maybe that's one of those things that you just kind of do to be like wouldn't this be cool to see the all blacks play england in yankee stadium or something right? yeah. just the only, the only tricky is. thing that we have to but run it's into tough, but that'd be tough because the sight lines right so and also yeah i think about football season itself yeah yeah this so would, it, yeah because that would oh, yeah because i guess like that would be everything too though right because you would have you would have to contend with like the nfl like assuming it's at the same time of the year right the nfl college football when does the mls season play is the mls going during that i'm not really a big soccer guy so I'm gonna... it's just it'd be like in the playoff the playoffs okay so it's well, one so, of the yeah, the, would be but done. I mean, you have 10 years to figure that out, though. So I'm sure you can work. I mean, we're thinking of all these logistic issues way too far in advance here. Um, you know, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, maybe you do that. But like I said, it's like maybe like everyone's I think everyone's kind of mentioning cities. I think that's where you could kind of go. Like if you were to go with like 12 cities, I think you kind of go to the 12 biggest cities and maybe even try to make it work. Um, you know, you probably go to Texas for something like there's three MLR teams in Texas, 
So yeah. like you're hoping that by the time 2031 rolls around, like rugby is taken off and maybe hopefully is super popular within Texas because they're going to have their little three team in state rivalry there. Um, so maybe you know if Cowboy Stadium's too small, maybe you gotta maybe you go play in Houston or um, something like that, right? And you're probably spreading it a lot through the. Um, you're probably spreading it a lot through you know different parts of the United States. You got 12 yeah. stadiums. Go after 12 different regions. Try to get you know people to go. But maybe you kind of got to go closer because it's like the United States is a big country physically, ge- like geographically. Um, so, you know, maybe you gotta like, think of how you can, you know, sort of bring some fans in to accommodate travel between, you know, American cities, or maybe like, you know, you make, make it easy to be like, say, if you go New York, Boston, Atlanta, Washington, or something like that. Right. And it's like, it'll be, you know, maybe if you, maybe if you're a fan, you can buy tickets to those games and stick on one coast or whatever. Sure. Um, but hey, you know, there's, uh, if this happens, it's in 10 years or 11 years. So yeah. lots of time to figure things out. It's a great idea. Um, I'm fully behind a American World Cup. Um, the, American, the Americans hosting the FIFA World Cup did wonders for soccer um, on our continent too. Um, and that kind of coincided with the MLS taking off as well. Um, so, you know, there's, I, I think if you did it, you can kind of hype it up and stuff. And um, I think it would be great for the game. Um, I like Stu's idea. Put one one stadium in Canada. Have one one stadium there. It might be fun. Um, but um, you know, if it's in North America at all, whether it's stadiums in Canada or not, um, I will be super excited and let, I'll travel. I'll probably I'm going to go to as many games as possible. Um, you know, bounce around the United States wherever those stadiums actually end up being. I will be there. Um, so to answer a question previously. Um, the Kamanashi Recovery Memorial Stadium has 6,000 permanent seats. Okay. And then they added an extra 10,000 temporary for the, for World, the Cup. World Cup. Yeah. Well, okay. So, like, and fair enough, then maybe maybe that is will become an option to kind of do that. But it's definitely doable. You have to in be Houston. able to actually physically yeah, do I, that. I don't though, think right? they could like, do that in Glendale. It's, it's a cement Houston might fortress. Be able to, though, right? Houston, but, you might be able to. Yeah. Okay, guys. Um, so last when thing I that said we're... playing in Houston, though, too, I was thinking of like where the Texans play. Yeah, not yeah. necessarily not where the, uh, the Saber Cats play, but maybe that's another option that you can have too. Or at the very least, that should be like you can kind of you figure like if there's more like teams starting up their own stadiums, like those can become like practice facilities and things like that for the World Cup too. For sure, even if they're not hosting games because they're five thousand seats or whatever. Um, so the last thing we're going to talk about, and um, this was kind of picked off, kind of. During that MLR kickoff, again, uh, little pieces of information get dropped in that, and it was really interesting. But there was mentions of a 14th team that was in the 90-day window as well. Um, And from the way that it was kind of talked about, it didn't seem like it was Hawaii. Um, Guys, a little bit more clarity on that, because if there's another team outside of Hawaii that's trying to enter the league, you know, that's, that's a whole nother story that that's going to get broken in the next little bit. Yeah. Well, I think everyone has assumed by now that if a team is um, trying to join the league, it's going to be for 2022. It's far too late now for 21 inclusion. I think if they could set a team up, then they can spend the 21 season hosting exhibition games against local competition and then would be in a place for 22 to be able to show the gut show ML, mlr that they're ready for the competition they're ready to in the similar way that um atlanta um the free jacks and dc were able to come in for the 2020 season now, where this team is going to be based, unfortunately, I have no idea. I'm, all I can tell for sure is that it's definitely in the United States. It's not in Canada. There's been no rumblings about a surprise Vancouver team coming through. Although... Well, see, you know, the funny thing is when... If it, yeah. If it comes back and you're watching this episode again and you're wearing the Vancouver team merch, I'll just be wiping the egg off my face. So. Well, see, the thing that spooked me is I saw that someone was talking about that. Maybe it was Derek was talking about that on Twitter. And then I saw that there was going to be a big announcement out East 
Now, it turns out that was just a new club and pitch for uh, one of the clubs that's yeah. that's uh, very popular Halifax, out east in Nova yeah. in, in Halifax. But like they just kind of coincide at the same time, and I'm like, oh my god, is there going to be a Halifax team before a Vancouver team? But well, there have <laughs> been not the case. But well, the owner of the Halifax Wanderers, I believe, had said. Had expressed interest. In yeah, so yeah, there's but, a little but, bit of traction to that. Before. But he's done but absolutely nothing about that interest either. Oh, yeah. but, at least as yeah, far as I know. Before we like, knew that, it was like the dominoes all falling into yeah. place. What's going I on? also would like to own an MLR team, but that doesn't mean I can do it. I would also like to be extremely fit. I haven't yeah. done anything about it. I'm not putting it, in no? any effort to do that, though, am I? Um, um, yeah. So if it was to, if I had to choose where I would want a MLR team in, say, um, mainland uh, United States, and I had to pick it out of a hat, I'd say, well, I wanted to be on the um, in the Eastern Conference because we now have a overstacked uh, Western Conference, I would say, with um, seven teams there. So if I had to pick anyone, I'm kind of on the fence of Chicago, which seems to be the rugby heartland. But I would also be tempted to have it in Miami as well. I mean, we're getting into Miami in the MLS. And so if you could do a um, shared stadium deal for the time being in uh, Fort Lauderdale, probably butchered the pronunciation of that. Uh, no, you're good. And, you're you're good. Right, um, so, and because I know that Inter Miami are building their own stadium, which would actually be in Miami. And. So it would then be that, okay, we'll share this stadium in Fort Lauderdale. And then once uh, into Miami move into their actual stadium, then, you know, increase tenancy in this Fort Lauderdale stadium. And, you know, and, you know, nice climate. You can have, uh, you can open the season in the East instead of uh, the difficulties we have up here in the North. So, you know, and uh, nice and warm and, and uh, you know, the good uh, mixed population with uh, uh, Latin American and Cuban um, immigration, because I know that Inter Miami, instead of calling themselves Inter Miami Football Club, their full name is Club Internacional de Football Miami. So, you know, maybe put a bit of a Spanish flair behind it and uh, see how that works. But that's all just hypothetical yeah. at this point. Um, yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, uh, Pete Steinberg didn't really give, you know, too much indication on where that city would actually be other than its mainland United States. Um, and, you know, I, I think the one thing that was interesting that it's like they've talked about and I've, you know, kind of heard, heard some people talk about too is it was like, I think the, the Hawaii bid kind of became public because Hawaii sort of made it public. Um, whereas it looks like this this ownership group is, you know, kind of, you know, keep keeping quiet a little bit. And maybe that's the way to go about getting your franchise into the league. Um, but um, to go with kind of Stu, with Stu, the conversation that Stu sort of started there as far as where you would want it. Basically what I would do. And, you know, if I'm George Killebrew, this is what I would want to do. But I'm also kind of recognizing that no matter what you do here, you know, you're kind of, you know, you're limited to like the cities where people actually put up the put up the money or put up the, the capital and the resources to actually put a team in. Um, but I would be targeting the biggest TV markets um, in, you know, biggest TV markets in North America or in the United States. And I think I would for me, you know, right now, the top 10 biggest TV markets in the United States are New York, L.A., Chicago, Philly. Dallas, Washington, Houston, San Francisco, um, slash Oakland, San Jose, the Bay Area, Bay Area I guess, um, Boston, and Atlanta. So if you're kind of looking at that, the MLR already has teams in a bunch of those cities, obviously New York, LA, um, Dallas, Washington, Houston, um, Boston, and Atlanta are already covered, um, or at the very least New England, depending on how specific that Boston actually is. Um, but so to me, that's where I would go on, you know, I would want a team in Chicago, Philadelphia, 
um, the Bay Area. Those would be the ones that I would start tar- that I would target immediately. Um, st- Miami. I also like I like the idea of Miami. When I interviewed uh, Gaston Mirez and Leandro Livas last year, they said that's where they would want a team to go, um, based on just you know to just to be an awesome road city basically um so you know they there there there's there's some player votes that are in favor of miami obviously i believe it was uh you know a few months back or however long it was where the former rct toulon owner was saying that he was interested in putting a team in miami um so maybe that's i and I, it's funny i was just going to mention that i've got that i brought that up uh just to kind of refresh my brain about that what did he what did he actually say uh just that uh so i'm just pulling up the america's rugby news this was kind of back when uh, MLR first an- kind of announced that Dallas and um, LA were joining. Um, apparently details were emerging that the former majority owner uh, for uh, RC uh, Toulon um, tends to have a team operating in 2022 under the RCT banner with links to the French top 14 side. So very similar to, you know, um, the uh, the um, soccer club in Ottawa, um, you know, it's going to have a tie to another foreign club, um, mm-hmm. where less other teams have kind of done, you know, the Scottish, you know, rugby kind of affiliation. So it's very interesting. Yeah, and um, yeah. So I mean, maybe, maybe there's more has happened with that. Um, for me though, I, I agree with Stu. I think Chicago has to be like, again, as far as wanting a team, I think Chicago has to be at the top of that list. Um, just cause it is, it is the biggest market. And I mean, you look at those, that, that top 10 markets that I just rattled off all the leagues, like the most successful leagues in North America, the big five, even like the WNBA, um, you know, uh, you know, lacrosse, like every, every major, every sport league that's at the top of their level, Right. Um, whether it's men's sports or women's sports, the highest level that you can play, right? They have teams in these 10 cities with the exception of the NHL that doesn't have a Houston and Atlanta team. Well, they used to have an Atlanta team, but you know, that, that, uh, that didn't work out too well. Um, they've had an Atlanta team twice and that hasn't worked out too well either time. Both teams had a very nice kits. I will say that really nice jerseys. Yeah. Uh, you like to hold on, hold on, hold on. You like the Thrashers jerseys. Yeah, the nice Is baby that... blue. It's really it's good. I like the it. baby blue that had the Atlanta down the side of the arm. Yeah, yeah, oh, I like it. It was on. different. Oh, come on. Come on. You're probably like the Gilgronies probably have the nicest jerseys in Major League Rugby too with the Giants. It, it's different. Yeah, I, didn't think yeah, it, I didn't think it was good. It's different. Is it yeah, um, different? You just said it. You, don't think, you just said it. They had really nice. They also had that one jersey that was like the motocross one too, right? Or like it looked yeah. kind of like a moto. They had like just Thrashers and then. Kovalchuk would rock the giant 17 on his stomach. That was terrible too. The Thrasher's jerseys were ugly, man. I don't, um, although, you know, what's a fun, really weird thing. Pull up the USA rugby logo and a Thrasher's logo next to each other. Oh, it's the same just, thing. Just for fun. Yeah. It's, it's kind just of, a different, it's just, it's a barely yeah. different bird. Yeah. It's just a different bird. No, yeah, you know what? Funny. I'm looking at this jersey. I think it's a I want to change the jersey. name. I want to change the name of the USA uh, rugby team to the Thrasher's just for fun. No. Um, I like, I like what I'm looking at right now. No, put put it up on the screen share. Show Stu and let's see what Stu's. Stu, do you know what we're talking about here? The Atlanta uh, Thrashers. Are you aware? I know the USA Rugby logo, but the right. Atlanta Thrashers is a. Uh, Dan, pull up an Atlanta Thrashers one. jersey for me. I'm sending it. I'm putting in. Anyways, um, up, in, in my opinion, I, I agree with you guys. I agree with you guys. I think Miami is a is a hotbed yeah. that you need to touch. Uh, Miami fans are relentless in any any sport, whether it be football or or uh or um uh, baseball or uh football but uh i also think that there's there's one place that we didn't mention and uh they've been in the news recently because of their intent to join a tens tournament um uh, yes. but i think that ohio should be given another chance um in mlr at least because um ohio sports fans are relentless they are just animals when it comes to their to their sports and uh, it you know the AV, Ohio Aviators in pro rugby actually had pretty good little fan base that was growing, and their games were pretty well attended compared to some of the other games. Where I think that they deserve another chance at pro rugby. I think that um, there is definitely a catchment area 
of of fans and university programs and and players that are coming out of there that you know they could definitely pull from and i think that it it is yeah, a place right. that that could deserve another spot i want to see the aviators fly again that's what i want yeah, and I mean, well, don't that tense team too? They got Kyle Bailey and Eric Howard representing uh, Canada on that squad that's heading down to Bermuda, I believe it is. Um, so it'll be great to see. I think ultimately there's a lot of great options. Um, we'll wait and see who it is. Chicago, to me, is still at the top of my list just because it is. We did kind of mention rugby hotbed. I know I saw like when, you know, people were discussing where the World Cup final would be if it, the United States did host it. Chicago was like one of the number one answers that came up with that. Um, like you said, they've had success hosting all blacks games, hosting Ireland games. Um, it's, you know, it, it's one of those cities that has, has a solid rugby history. Um, and I think too, just the added element of it being a massive media market. Like I, like I kind of said before I got sidetracked with how ugly the thrashers jerseys were, um, the uh which hopefully still have you had a chance to look at the chat that dan just sent you let me know what you think of that um but either way i think the like you look at it all the major teams put teams in the biggest market there is name a name a top level american or north american pro sport league that doesn't have a team in chicago Um, yeah, you can't think of one because it's like everyone has a team in Chicago. Chicago is one of those cities that you have to hit. Um, and I mean, I, I kind of pulled it up here too. Cleveland, like Cleveland, Ohio uh, is 19th largest market, which I mean, like that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's like you want to, you know, you, you're calling us if you're going to call itself Major League Rugby. Um, like major league is a title that carries a lot of weight in North America. It means that you're at the top of your game. It means you're at like the highest level of the sport that you can possibly be at um, within this continent. And, you know, I think you've got to go after, you've got to put teams in some of those, the biggest markets there. So um, that's where I would look to put one. Um, but I think, you know, you brought up points on Miami, even Ohio, um, you know, obviously if the aviators are kind of putting in some work to kind of come back partially too, right? Like maybe that's, Maybe there's an opening there, but um, who knows? I guess we'll wait and see. Um, it looks like the, the ownership group is being a lot quieter than um, Kanaloa, Hawaii, which might be the uh, the way to go about doing this. Um, so um, well, I'm sure we'll, we'll wait and see, and I guess we'll find out one way or another, um, you know, I guess whenever this 90-day window actually ends here and, you know, if it'll be for 2021 or what I think is, I kind of agree with Stu, which might be more realistically 2022, so... Who knows? And, and we'll see. You know, hopefully some news will, will leak out in the next couple of uh, weeks about what they were kind of talking about. Well, gentlemen, that is it for tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Um, again, thanks. Thank you very much, Cole, for, for joining us. It was a great little uh, little chat. And uh, stay tuned, uh, folks, because we've got a couple more of these interviews lined up. So, if you want to listen uh, to more of our podcasts, you know, we've been talking uh, throughout the summer about uh, the Arrow signings and, and news uh, that has been kind of hitting MLR and uh, North American rugby. Um, you can go to either Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to La Rouge Rugby, and we will have all of our links and information there. And uh, gentlemen, enjoy your week, and uh, next week we will uh, get back together.